Hey everyone, this is Steve Good, and welcome to our first episode of The Coin Chat. I am joined by my good friend, David Wen, and today we're going to be talking about what is cryptocurrency. Hi Steve, glad to be here. This is awesome. The whole thing with cryptocurrencies is just blowing up. It's all over the news, and I think there's, you know, the, we're on the, the uh, we're starting with the hype cycle pretty steeply, but really, really looking forward to learning more about this. Yeah, it's been absolutely crazy. There's just so much going on. There's so many new companies launching crypto. There's just so much news going on. It's just so exciting right now. I absolutely agree with you. And this is such a great time to start talking to people and telling them about what cryptocurrency actually is. Yeah. So, I mean, you've helped me a ton. And I, I, you know, I'd like to find out more about the, uh, the whole world of crypto. And the more I find out, the more questions I seem to have. So do you want to just uh, we'll start off by just defining exactly what is a cryptocurrency and, and giving a little background on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So let me start by telling you what a cryptocurrency is not. So, you know, even in the previous ep episode, our, our uh, premiere episode, we talked a little bit about what alternative currencies are, and we intentionally really didn't talk about what digital cryptocurrencies are, but digital currency or cryptocurrency is yet another form of an alternative currency, Bitcoin being the first one that started in 2009. But the difference is that you have what are the fiat currencies that we all know, things like rupee, dollar, euro, yen, which are all formal author authorizations or decrees. That's what a fiat currency is, meaning that they're government regulated and government backed. Um, and that's, you know, that's quite significant because it means that those cu currencies are all regulated. They're all understood and they're valued and people understand what they are. And now we've got this new set of alternative currencies that have come along that are defining the world in a whole different way. So what makes these unique in the digital world is that you can transfer value from person to person in such an efficient way, uh, much more efficient than you can with normal fiat currency and banking. And the reason being is because all the transactions in crypto are going through computers, whereas normally in a banking world, you're doing it through a bank, which is a central environment or, or, or entity that operates and runs this for you. But in crypto, everything is decentralized. By decentralized, what I'm saying is that when you're doing a transaction, and David, if I were sending money to you or you to me, there's a whole network of computers that are actually out there validating the transaction and doing the settlement and the confirmation process. You know, the normal currency that all goes through a bank, crypto goes through an array of computers, uh, governments govern normal currency, and we the people in a global sense have consensus and have computers that are governing and operating and running all of the transactions and settlements of digital currency. So in a way, it's really quite a different world having a decentralized world versus a centralized one. So the intermediary is no longer the banks, it's a network of computers uh, the exactly. The consensus. Exactly. Okay. So it makes a, so, it's a pretty significant difference when you think about the how do I, you know, transact and you're thinking about mm -hmm. I want to send you money and a bank is doing what it does in a digital world. It's like, well, wait, what's happening? There's no bank that I have to walk into an office and do anything. It's all digital. It's electronic. It's completely mm -hmm. automated. You know, there's no human intervention whatsoever. Really, really different way of, of thinking. It's a new paradigm. So it also streamlines the process. I would imagine instead of like uh, in the old days with the banks actually flying the checks that we write to different clearing houses and then processing those and crediting and debiting everybody's accounts. Now we're looking at what a matter of seconds or minutes in order for us to send money directly. Like how how do I send money? Um, right. Yeah. So how long does it take? It's good. It's good. Right. So, you know, the so here's the interesting thing. Let's kind of step back and talk about, like, how does it work normally? Because that's the that's the part that's sort of we're all used to it. But the question is, why are we used to it? It's a little bit crazy that we're so comfortable with waiting a long time to send money to each other. So think of the normal way, which would be the most simple way would be, you know, we're going to use PayPal because we're all familiar with PayPal. You're going to send me money. I'm going to send you money. The the thing is, let's go through what a PayPal process looks like. I go onto PayPal and say, hey, David, I'm going to send you $100 or 100 euros or whatever. And you say, great. So you give me your email address. I say send. PayPal withdraws money from my bank account. It puts it into my PayPal account and then moves it to your PayPal account. And then it shows up in your PayPal account and you say, great, the money's here. I want to spend it. 
I want to withdraw it and put it in my bank account. And then I say, ah, you got to wait three to five days. Uh, the only exception being if you actually go onto a website and you might say, I want to pay with PayPal and it's cash sitting there, you can then use the cash that's there. But if you want to withdraw the money and have a full end-to-end -end transaction, you're talking about three to five days. Not really the most efficient method, but it's something we've sadly gotten used to. That's kind of the way of the world. Now, so, um, go Steve, ahead. Yeah. So it, just so I have a better understanding of that uh, paradigm, right? Essentially, PayPal is like a digital uh, payment service on top of the traditional banking model. And then crypto is something else entirely. It's a different animal. It's a completely different process. Yeah. So normally, if you think about normal banking, whether it's whether it's PayPal or a normal bank, the the processing of, of all of that between the banks and the settlement processes are, are all roughly the same. There there are differences between how the banks operate, but the process in terms of the the settlement and the transactional processing is the same definition. Now in digital, there's a big difference in that what happens instead of going into a bank account is you go into your crypto wallet. And the wallet is where you store your crypto coins. Each coin has its own wallet. So Bitcoin has a wallet, Ethereum has a wallet, and each of your wallets is where you store your coins. Now what would happen there is I could then go into my wallet and say to you, okay, David, send me your account details, your wallet address, and then I will go ahead and send you one Ether, two Ether. I send it. You'll have it anywhere from a couple of minutes to perhaps an hour. Literally settled, transacted in your wallet on your side. It's done, and you can access that money immediately and use it or send it on to someone else as need be. So the intermediary in the sense of the crypto world is far more efficient because of the fact that the intermediary is just a bunch of computers that are running 24-7 nonstop. Banking, there's all the <laughs> steps in the middle, right? You've got people, you have weekends that get in the way. You want to send me money on a Friday night? I'm not going to get it till next week, Wednesday or Thursday. Maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get it sooner. But if I send it to you on a Saturday afternoon in crypto world, you'll have it on Saturday within an hour. Wow. So this is the new banker's hours. It's going to be 24-7 if we're using this new paradigm. And how... Well, there's... there's no, so hang on. There are no banker's hours, right? So why do you need the banker? Because you and I have just <laughs> transacted with each other and there was no bank in the middle because the bank is actually the computers in the decentralized environment that's operating and running this all for us. It's amazing that you can go from a model that's five days a week, Monday to Friday, and everything is shut into a model where everything is 24 seven and we don't need bankers to intervene for a number of transactions that are revolving around just sending and receiving money. So let me restate that. So the bankers hours have now become banking hours 24 seven, right? Because we don't need the bankers anymore. We can do the banking anytime between ourselves and not have the, um, the delays of uh, waiting for them to be open. I mean, certainly for some hours. things, there's going to be a number of banking things that will take time to be replaced. But this is certainly the beginnings of a potential for a lot mm -hmm. of banking transactional processing to be replaced simply because it's more efficient, not just for payments, but also for other forms of transactional activities that take place between banks, interbanking. There are examples of that already happening now. This is going to be part of a very interesting evolution that we're going to witness in terms of how banking and transactions take place, how it changes. It's, it's really kind of a lot of unknowns in terms of where it's going. Now, just to mention about how the whole transaction model works in the crypto world, you've probably heard of the term mining. And yeah. mining is basically a process of settlement and confirmation. And there are people running various mine mining operations or that provide their computers onto nodes in a network enable to enabling those transactions to take place um, that process is what enables the transactions to actually occur is the mining process the miners are simply providing their computers and equipment to confirm the transactions globally they take a small fee for doing it but they're paid a small fee for doing it and our transactions are then effectively run through those networks very efficiently and very quickly and at the so, completion of each of those transactions, it's written into what's called a ledger. And that ledger mm. is something that's immutable, meaning it's unchangeable. So when we transact between each other, it's immediately written into the ledger, which means it's written, it's confirmed, it's settled, it's done. And it's, it's a public record for everyone to see, although not literally see, but it is electronically visible. Wow. So this, this leads me on to the, the question about 
when when you have this ledger, this public ledger, and it's you mentioned earlier, there's consensus, right? So it's distributed. There's there's more than one central repository for all of this. Is that correct? Yeah. So there's there's a there are thousands upon thousands of computers already deployed throughout the world doing these transactions and confirming them, and they work together in tandem to verify and validate transactions. Mostly because it's important to make sure that you don't get anybody trying to do a fraudulent transaction or trying to break the systems. There's so much equipment and so much validation taking place that they're all confirming against each other. And that's why you have a a decentralized environment so that if one environment goes off, all the others can verify and make sure that the transaction is valid before it's confirmed. And upon completion, it's written into a ledger, which is an electronic form of you know what people think of traditionally in ledgers as a paper version. But this is written electronically, so it's accessible and visible uh, globally. Wow, this is like yeah, this is clearly a, a huge shift in uh, the way things are being done. Um, you know, some other questions about this is like what what are some things that that people should know, or what why um, you know what are the reasons for for these these different types of coins, and what what is a coin? You know, like we we have this method for transacting. But I hear that there's many different types of coins. You hear about the big ones usually like Bitcoin and to some extent Ethereum. But uh, Steve, are there a lot of different coins um, and, and what are some of the the purposes of these coins? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, let's let's start with the basics. What most people don't realize, and it's funny, I hear this all the time when I talk to people. They just assume a coin is a coin and they can't understand why do we need 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 coins as currencies. And... The irony is that although all the coins can be used as currency, actually the coins can be broken down into three different types. So I'll just quickly run through what those are. The first Mm. group are coins that are actually currency. And Bitcoin is a great example of that. Litecoin is another example of that. They're simply coins that are being used to to define value. Um, They're just to use to send funds or currency from A to B, like what you and I talked about at the beginning. So I want to send you some money. You get it within 20 minutes, an hour, 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever it is. Um, The second is, and this is where it gets interesting. Many people get confused between what is Bitcoin and what is Ethereum. And even on CNBC or many of the other news channels, I often see that they don't really distinguish between them. Now, the second type of group of coins are actually platforms. Now, by platform is what I mean is that it's a currency as well, but the platform is actually there to create an infrastructure for creation of applications of various forms. So Ethereum is one example of that that creates what's called a smart contract. And the smart contract is an ability to create an electronic form of of a contract so that you and I can both send money, but also based on certain terms or conditions being met before the money transacts. And that's quite significant because imagine replacing a whole kind of processing of a contract with an electronic form so that people get paid on time. The th- that sounds uh, like something that we could talk about for hours. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so effectively, in this example, two parties can create an electronic uh, contract that enforces the payments, but there are other payment, there are other platforms like Waves and Lisk, to name a couple of examples of platforms. Um, the, the best analogy actually on the platform world, just to, to go before I go to the third one, the best analogy I can think of would be something like what an Apple App Store or a Google Play Store is. That's a store where you have access to a number of applications and they're providing you an infrastructure in which you can create these applications, you build them, you store them, you can use them, but you have to access them and get them from somewhere. So in a kind of a weird, weird but similar way, these platforms like Ethereum or Waves or Lisk are providing you a base in which you can create, and then you create these applications that sit on top. So that's that's what the second one is, is the platforms. The third one, which is actually where the, the majority of coins come from, and this is the kind of what I think is the exciting stuff and the stuff that most people miss or misunderstand, is companies that are out there creating real value and disruption across a whole range of different sectors. They have cool ideas, they've got a range of different ideas that they're trying to tackle problems in vertical sectors across finance, media, gaming, real estate and property, charities, travel, just to name a few. Uh, Many of them are creating both disruption as well as innovation. Um, They're trying to change the way we do things so it's more efficient, it's more automated, um, and it's really moving the traditional stuff like we spoke about how PayPal does things and it takes three to five days and it's working with the bank and a confirm and a settlement process and whatever else. 
And now we're moving from a more from the more traditional methods of PayPal and banking into a more innovative and efficient method or way of doing things. And yes, there are a lot of different coins, which are a lot of companies, but you know, at the, at the same time, it's not regulated. There are scams that go with it, uh, which we'll be covering in another episode. So just to summarize on this particular topic, there are basically three types of coins. There's the ones that we think of that are currency or a mm -hmm. store of value. There's coins which are platforms that enable you to build things on top of them. And then there's the real bulk of coins, which are actually companies. Now, one thing I want to mention on that, and this is kind of an interesting one, is not all of the coins are actually startups. So a couple of quick examples mm -hmm. I want to throw in here that are really interesting. Uh, one of them is a company that's out there called e Unicorn, that's an e-gaming platform that launched Unicoin Gold. So they basically mm -hmm. spun their business into a blockchain cryptocurrency business as well for e-gaming. Mark Cuban and Ashton Kusher are actually people that invested in the company to help them as part of that process. Another one is a company called Gravity4 launching the Lydia coin. Uh, it's an advertising company founded by a friend of mine called Gurbkash Chahal. And they built their business to uh, about a $100 million business. And they've now decided to move their advertising platform into a blockchain-based advertising platform with a lot of new features and some disruptive things that they're doing. Really interesting. But it's an established business. And now they're going into the crypto world and into the blockchain, adding new value. And there's another company that I can think of called Amizgo, which is out in Thailand. It's a payments platform. And they went from Amiz to Amizgo to create a crypto-based uh, blockchain environment for payments and banking. So those are just a couple of examples. So it's not just crypto companies that are startups. It's also existing companies that are also launching into cryptocurrency to transform and to make business go further than what we've seen so far. You know, this this sounds a lot like a, the development of a huge, huge ecosystem, like a little bit like the Internet was back in the days. And so is this another wave of technology evolution that we're seeing? And how, you know, do you... Uh, Describe what it is. Yeah, it's it's really uh, I mean, here. So here's my take on it. And I, I, you know, I've heard a few people refer to these things as Internet zero one two. I'll describe for you what I think it is and what I've heard other people describe. Um, tell me what you think. So uh, the first wave of the Internet actually was created by the U.S. government called ARPANET, which was the U.S. Advanced Research Projects Agency which goes all the way back to 1967, it was actually used as a platform for the military for just communication between various departments within the military and eventually was spun out to become what Internet 1.0 became, which is, you know, the whole dot-com craze, launching businesses, funding those projects. And then I've heard many people say that Internet 2.0 was really about the transformation to mobile apps, social media, smartphones, collaboration, and enabling us to move from kind of a open environment of messaging uh, and the enablement of information to flow into the formation of apps. Now, what I've typically seen in business is you start with apps and then you move to business processes and the, the enablement of automation and business process. And that's actually what I think is happening now. Internet 3.0 is all about putting in a blockchain, application layers, business services, business processes, and automating everything. And that's where I think we're beginning to go from, you know, what was just smartphones and apps into a kind of whole new generation of really enabling a much faster, more efficient level of communication and transaction. So, so instead of saying, why does it take so long for my money to transfer, for example, or why is my contract not been paid? I'm on 30 day terms or 45 day terms. What's going on? Why hasn't it been paid? Where's my money? We now move into a different universe where things are automated. So, you know, you don't have to say, where's my money? It's, oh, my money's here. It took me, you know, one minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, I received my money. Or how come my contract hasn't been paid? Well, it's all automated. It's a smart contract. So the terms of conditions are met and the money is transacted straight away. It's, a, it's, it's just a layer I see that's going on top that just adds more value. And that's what cryptocurrency is all about. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand or appreciate. You know, they call it other things like Ponzi schemes and frauds, but it's actually the enablement of business process and transacting and automation just to make our lives a, a whole lot easier. So, you know, this is interesting that you said the, talking about these waves, because I, I remember missing out on the first uh, couple here in the way that you described it. Right. Like I got a little personal anecdote here, but I remember, you know, when when I first 
got on the internet and it was like, oh, I have a dot matrix printer. I'm trying to figure out this whole browser thing. There was this thing called Gopher. And it was just about finding information and uh, sending some emails. And then I remember about 10 years ago, a friend of mine um, who's in the software field, I was asking him what he thought the next big thing was. And he was like, oh, it's probably apps. This is like right before the iPhone or right after the iPhone came out, right? And he's like, yeah, it's going to be apps. Yeah, and exactly. Sure enough, yeah. right, apps. This time around, and, and to you know, to be clear, the first two times I was just a bystander, and now uh, with this, as you described it, Internet 3.0, right, moving away. I mean, moving towards this uh, ability to pay um, in a way that doesn't have the bottlenecks of the traditional banking industry. Um, that's why we're talking, Steve, right? Because I'm like, okay, I want to learn all about this because I'm. Yeah, again, that's what cryptocurrency is all about now is really this wave 3.0. And a lot of people are, are more, you know, focused on the Bitcoin and the hype of Bitcoin and its rise over time and its its phenomenal increases that it, we're seeing generally happen. So Bitcoin was really like the first coin that we saw in 2009 as the first alternative cryptocurrency, digital currency. And then from there, there's been a whole wave or, or, or rash of additional coins and disruption that's now come in as another layer People realized they could create platforms that could put companies on top of the platforms and they started to build things. And it's creating a whole range or wave of new transformation and transaction, which a lot of people are either afraid of or simply don't understand. And I guess that's part of the reason why we're here, right? It's to try to help people understand and dissect this and break it down and, and understand what's really going on so that they're comfortable with it and they can then get engaged and ask questions and learn for themselves. Yeah, exactly. And I'm as a student of this, I'm in the shoes of like a typical person who is new to this. And one of the questions I have for you, Steve, is when you talked about the evolution of Bitcoin coming since like 2009 and so forth and all these other coins. Great. I understand the, the, the blockchain idea, the ledger idea at a, at a high level. Um, and then, you know, on a more ground level, how do we use the coins, um, whatever coins, like let's say Bitcoin, where can we use them and, and what for? Or better yet, let me restate that. We can use them as a currency, but you also mentioned earlier the other you know, categories that are forming this ecosystem. So yeah, how do we use the coins? So okay, so how do we use the coins is a great question. So you know, if you think about it, um, traditionally, uh, a coin like you know a dollar, a euro, a pound, you take the money, you go into a shop and you buy something. Now, in the world of cryptocurrency, a company creates a coin and that coin can be used within their own ecosystem to pay for services, products, or be used as a fee for transactions. The coin at the same time is also sitting on exchanges. So much the way that, for example, Microsoft shares are sitting on the NASDAQ and can be traded you can also trade the coins of the companies that you're using the coins in their platform. It's kind of a really weird and different model. The takeaway here is you would never be able to use Microsoft shares to pay for an upgrade of Office using Microsoft shares, <laughs> but, right? But, that seems ridiculous. Right, yeah, exactly. But in the crypto world, that's exactly what's happening is you can use the coins within the platform to pay for whatever it is that they're providing. If they're providing you software, you could use the coins within their platform to pay for the upgrade. So it's also mm -hmm. used at the same time on an exchange where the coins are going up and down in value and you can trade them. It's a very, very different way of looking at it. So the coins are tradable, they have value, they can be used as value within a platform, they have value between you and me, they kind of transcend what we think of typically as currency and what we think of in terms of utility by providing both at the same time. Wow, that is very different. I had no idea that it was like that. The, the question I have now is like, so with these new ways of using these coins and the ways that they represent value, do you think that there's going to be a convergence around a few major cryptos? Like we know Bitcoin is like the big name because it was like the first mover. Um, and then there's all these other hundreds or thousands of coins that you mentioned are, are out there. Uh, where will this, you know, all where, where do you think this will all go? So here, here's the most interesting part. And I think it's one of the things that people don't even realize unless they spend a lot of time in crypto. Much the way a country has an underlying currency, no matter what country you go to, they have a currency that you use when you're there. In crypto mm -hmm. world, if I can call it crypto world or the global environment that we live in, 
Bitcoin is generally the underlying currency for every platform that you log into and use in terms of mm. defining the value of things and the cost of things. And that's pretty fundamental because that defines already a starting point. Now, in a more broad sense, you know, a lot of the cryptocurrency projects that we see today, they won't survive because they're startups. And we all know that, you know, startups come, startups go. Not every startup is going to be successful. It's part of a process. Sometimes you have a fantastic concept and a fantastic project team and they just don't execute well or they make a mistake and they mess something up or they... They don't execute the way they should have. And you have average teams that are going to be exceptionally good. They'll have good investors and they'll do really well. The point is, there's going to be a lot of cool ideas and a lot of disruption. There's going to be a lot of poor ideas that lead to nothing. A lot of projects will come. A lot of projects will go. But there will be a number of projects that continue on because they're adding value. They're disrupting various industry sectors. Um, you know, if you think about the old way of crowdfunding, which was Indiegogo and Kickstarter, you know, that was a method to to starting off to funding of projects. And now we've moved into a crypto based method of funding projects, which are called ICOs or initial coin offerings. People often talk, talk about ICOs as potentially having scams associated with them. Some of them are scams. Many of them are actually valid companies just trying to get started, trying to launch a business, trying to disrupt something in an industry sector. Um, but as I said, they're not all startups. Sometimes they're established companies as well. Now, uh, an interesting side note is that recently Amazon was out buying just a whole load of URLs. Mm. Now, it might be because Amazon's planning something in the world of crypto. A lot of people think that Amazon will be one of the first entries into the space. And it might be that they're just buying the URLs to protect their own name. Don't know. It's really interesting to see where that one goes. I'd love to hear people's comments and collect their ideas and their opinions after this you know, chat and see what kind of comments they post to us. But, you know, there's a lot of things like that that are, that are happening. And I'm kind of wondering who is going to be the first you know, traditional sort of tech company, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Netflix, whomever, that's going to end up moving into some sort of a blockchain technology, because it's just a matter of time before some of the big name ones enter. Maybe Amazon Prime coin. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yeah, that's I'm curious as to see how this all plays out. Um, and you know, instead of being on the sidelines, right? How how do we know how to get started, and what what do we buy? Like, if me if I'm a, a new you know uh, I'm new to this, what do I do? I, I have got you know a little bit of a little bit of Bitcoin right now. It didn't seem like the easiest thing to get started with, um, and that's probably a good sign, right? Because it means I'm probably still relatively early. But um, should I just buy more? So it's. So first of all, the hardest part about getting started in cryptocurrency is knowing where to get started. Um, first, it's you know the, the whole idea of where do I buy my coins and then where do I buy other coins? That's one part of the whole problem. And it's difficult because a lot of this stuff is still based on a very techie based environment. But yeah. the harder part about it is the research you have to do to find out which coins you actually want to invest into. And, you know, Bitcoin is certainly, as we said, the underlying platform for crypto. So it's not going to go away because if it goes away, then I would have thought the entire underlying crypto environment goes with it or they'll have to find another mechanism for fees that go between the platforms. So that's that's kind of open, right? Um, Meaning like if Bitcoin goes away, we've got bigger problems. Well, if Bitcoin goes away, then all the platforms that you typically work on where they charge you in Bitcoin, they'd have to come up with a different way of charging you. Maybe they just. Oh, I was thinking coin. more like the end of the world. No, <laughs> let's hope it's not the end of the world. But yeah, I don't think I don't think that's going to happen. No, hopefully. but there are a number of coins that are out there. There's hundreds of coins that are out there, and I think the hardest part is for uh, for for individuals to kind of figure out which companies are actually the cool, innovative, disruptive companies, either established already a little bit and have got good products and good prototypes, and they're worth investing in or which ones are brand new, just starting out now, or which ones are even established companies that are launching. It does take an awful lot of work and research, but at the end, you know, it'll get easier. There will be more platforms and more information out there. There is stuff out there already. And of course, you know, how do I even take my dollars and yen and euros and get it into cryptocurrency? So there's a whole range of other things to, to dig into more. Uh, it's not something that you can just answer in two minutes because it is a really big topic. And unfortunately, you know, there are a lot of companies out there 
uh, with a lot of good ideas, and it's it's trying to find and spot the best ones. And there's no, let's say, magic bullet, easy answers to where to start immediately. But that's going to come with time as these platforms develop and evolve, as the whole crypto environment evolves. We're going to see more places that makes the whole thing easier in terms of how to get started and how to you know, research and where to find news and information. And all of that's going to be part of a process. And we're going to see that evolve. Yeah, so I guess we're going to have plenty of things to talk about going forward. And, and I, I feel like I've been drinking out of a fire hose. So it's probably uh, going to take me some time to digest all of this and just sort of get my bearings. And uh, I'm sure I'll be peppering you constantly, Steve, with more and more <laughs> questions as they come up. <laughs> you're always you're always welcome to throw more questions my way. Listen, uh, it's been great, David. Um, thanks for listening in, everyone. Next week, we will be talking about how to get started in cryptocurrency to the moon. Until next time. <laughs>